Uh, I hope you've been enjoying your journey through Ruth during the month of July, those of you who were here in July. Um, big thanks to Jared for taking us through a very special story all about faithfulness and love and God's goodness. And, and those of you who risked it, I hope you enjoyed your, your brief visit to Some of Us TV last Sunday. Um, and you're still here, so looks so far so good. Um, today, today we return to a well-known poem in the book of Ecclesiastes. And this poem has sort of been the backdrop to our whole year. Uh, it's in Ecclesiastes chapter three. And in particular today, we're going, our theme today is the line, a time for silence and a time to speak. Silence, of course, can be a real blessing. One of the few blessings that came out of that first lockdown, if you can remember that back that far, was the fact that all the airplanes stopped. You remember that? So you could go out for a walk without the drone or the roar of a jet or something cluttering up your, your hearing. Um, I mean, travel's great, don't get me wrong, but sometimes it's, it's, peace is just a good thing as well. And silence, that sort of profound silence, it enables you to hear things you don't normally hear, like birdsong and, and, and the water in the, in the brook and, and, and just little things like the wind in the trees. So silence can be good. It, silence also allows us, it allows us to think deeper thoughts without the distractions and listen for the quiet voice of God in our lives. So silence is good. Speaking is good too, though. Speaking helps us to connect, and it helps us to communicate, and to communicate things like wisdom and knowledge and truth and how we feel about something and how we feel about someone. Speaking is good as well. And I've chosen today's passage because today's passage has both. There's both silence and speaking. And, and to me, that's one of the reasons why it's so powerful. So Chris is going to read it for us. Where's Chris? Yep. And um, as you listen to Chris read these words from John chapter 8, could I ask you to listen out for the silences as well as the words? Today's reading is taken from the Gospel according to John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered round him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't know about you, but to me, there are some passages in the Bible that are a bit like old friends. They sort of, they, they always evoke memories of certain times and certain places. And today's passage is a bit like that for me. 
When I hear these words, I always remember two specific incidents that I experienced in my life. The first was when I was about 18, and I was a bit spiritually lost. And um, I was traveling, because it was my way of escaping everything. And I was on a train between Tehran and between Istanbul and Tehran in the days when you could get a train from Istanbul to Tehran. And, and there was a crowd of us all in the same carriage, and we're all travelers. We tend to be Westerners, and we're all heading out to India in the east. Some, some folks are going to start in search of enlightenment from Indian and Eastern religions. Other folks just like traveling. And some, well, a few of us, maybe just me, we're on our way just trying to reconnect with our past. And we're sitting in this railway carriage, and the, the journey took four days. You know, it's quite a long journey. Um, and this is getting later on in the journey. We got to know each other quite well. And we all used to congregate in different compartments. Like in this day, we were in this particular compartment. And the conversation got around to why we're going uh, in the direction, the Eastern direction, and what is religion and what is spirituality. And then bizarrely, people started talking about Jesus and what they thought about him and what they learned about him and what they knew about him. And, and I can remember this gnarled old hippie uh, who was on his way to meet his guru. He wasn't a Christian. On his way to meet his guru in some ashram in India saying, you know, my favorite story of Jesus is. And then he told the story of the woman caught in adultery. And I can remember the silence when he finished. So that was one of the incidents. The, the second incident, the second memory is of how, it's a very personal one actually, it's how one night in a village in the dark I was asked to tell a Christian story and I felt a bit embarrassed really because I didn't really think of myself as a Christian at the time. But I was, they pestered me and pestered me and pestered me. And I said, oh, all right. And I told the story that came to mind of the woman in adultery. And I can still remember the silence that followed the telling of that story. And I remember too that I couldn't sleep that night and how I felt the irresistible call of God on my life. And my life was never the same after that. Something changed. So there's there's two reasons why I love this passage. I was looking up to see if I've ever preached on it here at Liberton. I think I may have obliquely once, a long, long time ago. So why is this passage so powerful? Um, if you just watched today's, reflect, today's on right reflection, you'll have heard me say that if you want to meet God, you need to talk to Jesus. Because Jesus shows us who God is and what he's like. And I think we see who God is and what he's like in today's passage. I think in this passage we find a perfect balance between the God who is grace and the God who is truth. God's truth is all about all that's good for us, all that's good for others, all that's good for the world, and all that's bad for us, and bad for others, and bad for the world. That is God's truth. And God's grace is his loving concern for us. It's the fact that in everything he does, he's just longing for us to experience goodness in life. And he's longing to set us free from all that's bad in, in our lives. And I, see we, I think we see both grace and truth in this passage. So in this passage, Jesus is confronted unwillingly. <laughs> Jesus isn't willing, the woman isn't willing, but they're brought together because she's been caught in adultery. Now, adultery is when you're unfaithful to someone who trusts you. And, uh, you know, adultery, it may bring short-term happiness, but it always ends in long-term pain and bitterness and guilt and remorse. And that's the problem. That's why it's bad for us. But that's not what the Pharisees and the teachers in the law are interested in. They just want to trap Jesus. 
So they, they drag this poor woman in front of all the crowds in the temple because they know that according to the law of Moses, the Old Testament law, adultery is perishable, is punishable, sorry, by stoning. And although by Jesus' day this rarely happens, they're still trying to trap Jesus because if he says, if he disagrees with the law, then he's guilty of blasphemy and heresy, and they've got him. And if he agrees with the law, then he is being heartless and cruel, and the crowd will turn away from him. So they think they've got him in a trap. But I just love the way that Jesus responds, not with words, but with silence. And the result is probably more powerful than any eloquent legal argument or any wordy sermon. So, can I ask you just for a moment to imagine that you are there in the temple courts that day? And there's Jesus with his disciples, sitting probably on the steps, teaching about God's love. And there's the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. They're looking for a way to trap him. And there is this poor woman, publicly exposed, helpless, frightened, ashamed. And then there's everybody watching, the crowds. What's going to happen? What's Jesus going to do? And you're there. And a good question always to ask when we, when we find ourselves in the middle of a Bible passage like this is, in that passage, who am I identifying with? And in particular, a question for us all today is, am I the accuser or am I the accused? The accusers are the first to speak. Teacher, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Well, actually, in the law, Moses commanded that men be stoned as well. It's not just picking on women here, but it's interesting how they just single out women. What do you say? And so that's the trap. I'm reminded here of a sort of gaggle of mischievous reporters. I don't know how many times you watch the news and someone's done something stupid, uh, committed a blunder, and there's a gaggle of reporters around their door chasing them with microphones and cameras going, uh, Minister, 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 excuse me, Minister, what did you have to say about such and such? You, come on, tell us, Minister, we want to hear what you, you put your side of the argument, Minister. Have you ever watched that on telly? Yes, you know exactly what I mean. Well, I get the sense, because they keep going on at him if you read the passage. They want him to say something. Everybody's looking at Jesus. He's really the center of everybody's attention. And he doesn't seem to have anything to say. He just sits there doodling in the dust. And I can imagine the shouting getting louder and louder. Minister, are you going to resign, minister? You know what they say. Jesus, teacher, what do you have to say, teacher? What do you have to say? The law says stoning. What do you have to say, teacher? Come on, give us a quote. You know, there's a sense it's almost gleeful. Like, behind it all, there's a, oh, he got him now. Oh, he can't say anything. And if he does whatever he does, damned if he's quiet, damned if he speaks. Yes. Result, high fives all round. I am convinced that as he's sitting there doodling, he's not just doodling, because the Jesus I know would be praying. That would be him praying. He's not being pious about it. He's just praying. He's asking his father for help. He's asking the Holy Spirit for guidance. And then suddenly he stops doodling and looks up and everything goes quiet. And then he speaks and he just says one line. If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone.
Notice how no one's looking at Jesus anymore. They're all looking at his, his accusers. And notice how his accusers have now gone very, very quiet. They're the silent ones now. They, they can't think of what to say. And the silence grows and grows and grows. It's like now they're on trial. Now they're caught in a trap of their own making. And of course, Jesus' words are meant for us too today. Because, personally speaking, but I've got a feeling it's not just me, we too often are tempted to judge and condemn, to be judgmental, as we talked about earlier with the young ones. You know, it might be the annoying neighbor. I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up if you've got an annoying neighbor. Or the irritating colleague who never does what they say they're going to say and always leaves you to clear up their mess. Or even the person at the bus stop. You've been queuing there, the bus is coming, and they just waltz along straight onto the bus in front of you. Oh. I've, you've never done that, have you? No. <laughs> or it could be something you've heard about, some scandal. Or some, it's something that's turned up that's terrible and it's, you know, someone's been a total hypocrite for, for years and years and years and there they are. And you're just so, well, I'm so tempted to just, you know, think or speak out those words of condemnation. And yet Jesus' teaching, as we heard in the Sermon on the Mount, is quite clear. Judge not or you shall be judged. Leave the judging to God. Or, if any one of you is without sin, let them be the first to throw a stone. As I said, leave the judging to God. In this case, the one we know is God is sitting there doodling in the dirt. He's there. So, if we leave the judging to God, how is God going to judge the situation? How is Jesus, what's he going to do? Well, he's still doodling, but now I think he's praying. He's praying for, for his word. And remember, it's just a single line to have an impact. Remember, there's a quote in the Bible that says, the word is sharper than a, a double-edged sword. Well, he, the word has gone out from his mouth, just one line into the silence, and he's doodling in the dirt, praying that that, 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 that word would have an impact on those who are listening. And then at last he looks up. And all his accusers have gone. They're not there. Uh, in fact, the crowd has gone. The temple court is empty. The only person, apart from Jesus and his disciples, who is there is the woman. She's still there. And I can't help wondering why. Why is she still there? His accusers, her accusers have gone. There's no reason for her to stay. She could sneak off. She can go and hide somewhere now. Jesus isn't looking, but she's still there. And I think there's, there's something really, really important here. Why is she still there? Remember earlier I asked, you know, who do you identify with? Do you identify with the accusers? Do you identify with the accused? My feeling is the reason this woman is still there is because she, like many of us here today, many of us, she's someone who recognizes that their life is not perfect and that there are things that have been said and done that have caused hurt and pain and shame and regret and that that the, the, there are things that need sorted out before she can move on. And that the only one who can help her sort them out is sitting there in front of her. And maybe that's a feeling you can identify with. Maybe that's why you're here. We know 
We mess up, but the only one who can help us is a man called Jesus. And I just love Jesus' words. And I think they're the same words he's speaking to all of us today. Words that are such a perfect balance between God's grace and God's truth. He says, woman, where are they? Where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she says. And here it comes. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Neither do I condemn you. There's the grace. Go now and leave your life of sin. There's the truth. I'm setting you free, says Jesus. I'm setting you free. Here's your chance. I'm setting you free from your mistakes. I'm setting you free to make a better future for yourself and for your loved ones. I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. So, time for another final time of silence. A time when you can have that wee conversation with the God who loves you, who is with us just now. And you can just, for a few moments, ask that God to, to highlight for you what he's been saying to you today and what he wants you to do about it. Now, whoever you are, and for whatever reason you've come, hear these words of Jesus once more and know that they are words of grace and blessing. Neither do I condemn you. Go now and sin no more. Amen.